Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Hall. You can call me Dr. Kennard. I have a fake PhD, unlike my guest, Dr. Joshua Bowen, <laughs> who wrote this fantastic book. And I actually have a, slot, a cover of it right here. The Atheist okay. Handbook to the Old Testament, Volume 1 by Joshua Bowen, Dr. Josh. The link to the book is in the description. Now, there may be one or two of you out there who don't know who Dr. Joshua Bowen is. So I'm going to read a bit of his bio. It's, it's, he, he's done a bunch of wonderful things, but I'm just going to try to, to concentrate it. So Dr. Joshua Bowen graduated from John Hopkins University in 2017 with a PhD in Assyriology. Did I pronounce that right, sir? You did, yeah. Excellent. As well as his PhD, Josh holds a BS in religion from Liberty University, a THM in the Old Testament from Capital Bible Seminary, and an MA in Near Eastern Studies from the John Hopkins University. Prior to entering academia, Joshua was a chaplain in the U.S. Air Force, where he gained an AA in avionics. Sir, I am so happy to have you here. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm happy to be here. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny every time I hear somebody uh, say a BS in religion. <laughs> Oh, right. Well, that's me. That's, oh, I you, no, I'm no, no. But it just, it seems to fit. You know, that, sorry, that's terrible. I shouldn't say that. But <clears throat> sorry, well, let me just well, refocus. Right. <laughs> so I just want to say hello to everyone in the chat. If you want to ask uh, Dr. Joshua a question, go right ahead. Do I have a bunch of questions about his wonderful book? Yes, I do. But if you want to blast it and ask a question, feel free. So, um, and, and you know, I've seen you on other people's streams, and you've popped in on in the chat in some of my other shows. But I, I do have to say it's an honor um, speaking with you, Dr. Joshua. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure. Sure. So my first uh, uh, silly question, which I have a bunch of silly questions, of all the ologies, what brought you to a seriology? As against a Bab I don't even know if Babylon. Ology is a thing, or Hittiteology is a thing. But what brought you to Assyria, uh, Assyria as a as a topic? Yeah, I mean, so when I was finishing up my master's of theology, which was a big, it was a big master's degree. Um, it was 126 semester hours, so it was it, it took it, it was a six year degree. And the last two years that I was there, I was teaching Hebrew to the other graduate students. And I had a professor, several, a couple of professors come up to me and say, look, you're one of these weird people that likes to study. Um, and so we don't want to waste that. You need to go get a PhD. Like there, there aren't a lot of people that we tell that to, but be, because you have to have this certain psychosis to do it, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't want to waste it um, now that it's here. And so I said, well, great. W what's the best, like, how do I become the best Old Testament scholar ever? Right. That was like, that was my thought. And that led me down the road um, to Johns Hopkins. They have this phenomenal Near Eastern Studies department. Well, when I started looking into it, uh, like they have a Hebrew Bible section of the department, um, but they also have this Assyriology. And I have this thing where if a lot of people are doing this and very few people are doing this, I'm naturally drawn to doing the thing that few people are doing. And so I thought, well, gosh, like I, I, Assyriology sounds awesome. But then I met with Paul Del Nero, who would become my advisor, and just I fell in love with the field itself. So studying Sumerian, studying Akkadian. And so like they were actually worried when I applied, like, are you trying to get into the Hebrew Bible side of the department through the back door of Assyriology? And like, I was like, I'm not like cuneiform. I have fallen in love with cuneiform. And that's really what happened. I became an atheist that, you know, that first year and really stopped thinking for the most part about religion at all. And it was just reading Sumerian, reading Akkadian, reading Hebrew. Um, but that's what, that's what got me into it. Cool. Cool. I've heard um, that the people call it chicken scratching. Um, is that true? I can show you some. Sure. So and, this, okay, uh, okay. So this, yeah. Can you see? Let me see if I can get that to focus enough. All right. Um, I, I are there wedges because I've heard yeah. that cuneiform is um, the term cuneiform is based on the Latin for wedges. Yeah. So it's. Um, 
Yeah, it's uh, it, basically what they're doing. Sorry, I was thinking about two things at once. Basically what they're doing, th this is an incantation model that was made by a good friend of ours, Jeremiah Peterson, D Dr. Jeremiah Peterson, who is also an Assyriologist, and he has an Etsy store. And I oh. can't remember the name of it, but it's linked in all of our, I think it's linked in all of our videos, or if it's not, email us if you want to. But he's very reasonably priced, but he made this for us. But it's an incantation, and you can see from the side, there's a hole in the top. Right. And ostensibly, they would have worn this and, uh, you know, to ward off evil demons or whatever. But, yeah, the, the way that they wrote in cuneiform is they had a, I don't have a pen or anything, but they had a, a stylus. And they would take this piece of clay and they would, it had an edge to it. They would impress it into the clay and form these wedges. Um, and each of the wedges sort of most of the wedges uh, form syllables. So ba, ka, a, ta, whatever. And then you sort of string them together uh, to form the way words are pronounced. So like uh, the word mundu, uh, you know, he, he built would be mu, un, du, three signs. Interesting. So, Interesting. so uh, big zebra. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Let me try to hit it. Re All right. I think we covered this, but Big Zebra asked, so uh, a BS in religion, a Bachelor of Science in the Study of Religion. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. But it sounds better the other way. It, it does. <laughs> so uh, I was looking through your bio, and I saw that your thesis is in the Lamentational Liturgies of the City of, of Kish. Is that the print? Kish. Kish, all right, in, in the city yeah. of Kish. So what are they lamenting? Yeah, uh, so if anybody's interested in this, my the the not the most recent book, but the one before that I published was about this topic. It was my dissertation, but I made it popular. Um, so basically, in in the ancient Near East, in Mesopotamia, um, there are things gods are very capricious, right? And things can trigger them. Things can set them off. And it doesn't take much sometimes to do that. And the, you know, the idea that they had was that if the God leaves, if the, if the, the deity leaves the city, and there's a deity at least for each city, if that deity leaves, everything goes to pot, right? All hell breaks loose in the city because that, that God's not there protecting them anymore and, and holding things together. So there were these, any of these times, they, they refer to them as like liminal times these, these when things would happen where the god might be tempted to leave they would recite these or sing these laments and in doing so they what they're lamenting is they're they're basically painting a picture through this sad lamenting song of all the bad shit that would happen if the god left so oh you know enlil if you leave your city you know, the walls will fall down and the sheep will die and the people will be killed by the Western, you know, invaders and blah, blah, blah. So basically, this is how bad it will be. Please don't leave. Right. right. Um, and uh, so th things that could cause that were like if they were doing uh, renovations to the temple, the temples made out of mud brick, mud brick lasts like 50 years and you got to do some serious rework to it. Well, if you go and you, you know, sort of screw with the God's temple, he might get pissed and leave, right? So then you you have this priest there, the Gala priest, and he says, all right, you know, please don't leave, please don't leave, come on, it's okay, you know. And what the way they describe it is the Gala priest is there to appease the heart of the God. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing through these laments. So uh, there are lots of different ways that that could, you know, the, the, the things that could potentially drive the the deity out like if they go in procession with the statue the cult statue maybe it jostles it too much or maybe he's out for too long whatever and he might just leave um so lots of different things that could happen but that's what they're doing uh, are the liturgies meant to be sung or part of them meant to be sung yeah the, it's definitely performative um and we have like we know that uh the, the, there's the liturgies themselves are named after musical instruments. N not all of them, but but many of them are. Um, so like the balang is the Sumerian word for a type of musical instrument. It's debated whether it's a harp or a drum. It's weird that those would be the two options, but there it is. 
uh, there's the Er Shema, and the Er Shema is the Sumerian word Er to Shem five Ma. And uh, in case anybody doesn't know just off the top of their head what that means, um, er, er to are, are tears, and then the Shem is a Shem drum. It's a type of drum, so it's tears played on the Shem drum. Uh, so, yeah, these things were sung, but they, they have very clear performative aspects. Different people uh, would have different roles that they would either read or sing. Uh, but, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely sung. I don't want to put you. I don't want to put you on the spot, sir. But could you? But you're going a, to. But could you sing a verse or a line? The problem, I think. So no is the short answer. Okay, we good. don't know how they were sung. Like we don't know the pronunciation of them. We have. Uh, there's a guy named Sam Merrillman, who is working on the musical side of of the liturgies. And we have some sort of tantalizing clues as to what might have, a, you know, affected tone, um, that that sort of thing. But because we don't, so let me say it this way: I could sing to you some Hebrew, uh, some some Hebrew lines like Psalm twenty three or something. But it's because it would be based on a modern, like a not a a more modern. Ashkenazic or Sephardic tradition, and the the, the the way they pass down those notes, and like we probably have it, we're much closer, obviously, to uh, what what it probably sounded like. Uh, but as far as we don't have a tradition that has been passed down and maintained, so I would I wouldn't be able to do it. Also, I haven't memorized Sumerian uh, lines, so that's the other problem. Sure, sure, sure. I I, I understand. Like I said, I, I know I was putting you on the spot. It's like how interesting would that be? Um, but you know, one of, and, and I want to say, I want to take a step back and say, I really enjoyed your book. I read it cover, cover to cover. You, uh, brought out the topics, you explained the topics in a, in an easy to understand way and in a very organized way too. And so it seemed like you set out what you wanted to do, explain mm -hmm. to the reader how you were going to do it. And you executed on that very well. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that was uh, definitely the goal. And actually, Megan and I were, uh, she tweeted about it yesterday. Um, I'm working on volume two now. I just, I'm just about done the Exodus chapter. And I said, you know what? I, I think we've got enough here for a volume three. And so she said, oh, well, let's brainstorm about it. And uh, we've got it laid out, got the outline done. So that's pretty fantastic. excited. What I noted in a part, I think it was in the introduction, that you talked about the scholarly consensus. Why is that important to point out what scholarly, scar, I'm gonna to try to say words now, everyone. Why is it important to mention what the scholarly consensus is? Yeah. Interesting that you ask, because I had a sort of a Twitter back and forth this morning, which I'm so loath to do, because I, I always end up doing it on my phone. And I always end up thinking halfway through, my God, I have so many better things to be doing with my time. Um, but part of the back and forth was that the person was intimating, well, this is just your opinion. It was about Ezekiel 26 um, in this recent video that I that I, uh, I, I did an interview on Myth Vision uh, podcast channel. And they were like, oh, well, I disagree with your conclusion, your interpretation. And my response was, well, this isn't my interpretation. This is the scholarly consensus uh, of, of what's going on with these data points. And really, without missing a beat, uh, and, and not, I guess to, to, to no sh surprise of mine, well, I don't care about majority position was sort of the response. And it's like, yeah, you should. So, um <laughs> And, and the reason that that's the case, because it, that's, and it was in this tweet as well, followed up with like something akin to majority doesn't equal truth. Those two things are not connected, right? Caring about scholarly consensus and consensus equaling truth are two completely disconnected things, but people lump them into one and they really need to be careful not to do that. So uh, a good analogy, I think, is... Uh, you could probably go out and find a doctor right now that will tell you it's totally cool to eat cheeseburgers every day 
and to not worry about exercising. And he would say, well, why? And he said, well, we know so many people that live into their 80s and 90s by eating cheese, you know, they eat cheeseburgers every day and they don't exercise. And we know lots of people that, um, or at least some people that, uh, you know, died in their 50s from heart attacks and they were, you know, exercised a lot, very health conscious. Okay. Well, if you then go to every other <laughs> goddamn doctor, they're going to say, mm, please don't listen to that doctor. Um, the, the overwhelming consensus among doctors is you should exercise and you should eat well. Well, does that make it true? No, it doesn't. Right. Um, but there's a reason that all of the doctors <laughs> say don't eat cheeseburgers every day, right? There's all this data. There's all this research that's been done. And the way that the way that scholarly review, peer review works is that when you come out with a paper, when you come out with a study, all the, the way that scholars can, one of the ways that scholars get ahead in their fields is by critiquing other scholars, right? You know, Frank said that this is the, the, the right interpretation. Well, let me show you why it's not, and I'll publish a book about it. Well, now, like, I'm, now, now I've got some cloud, I've got some prestige. This is how we get ahead by publishing, right? So um, there's incentive there to prove other people wrong. And this is how the peer review works. Uh, you, you don't have shit getting put, put out there for very long. Because once it's out there, then people just destroy it, right? And, and, and that's good. It's good that it works that way. Um, and I'm not a scientific person, but I understand that science works exactly the same way, probably even more so, I would imagine, um, because that's much more testable and repeatable. There's a methodology to it that's that's much more precise. So when it comes to things like the Hebrew Bible or the ancient Near East, we all are working with the same data points. And what I mean by that, not to be too simplistic here, but like if a detective walks into a room and there's there's a gun on the floor, that gun has been recently fired. We have a test report that shows that it's been recently fired. And we have a test report that showed that Jim is the one that fired it recently because he's got gunshot residue and it matches. And there's also a dead body on the floor and the bullet that killed him, we can we can determine came from this gun. Here's the test report for it. These are all the data points. And if you go into a courtroom, the defense and the prosecution all have the same data points. But their interpretive models, what they, how they tie all those data points together will very often, if it's a good defense attorney, differ, <laughs> right? The defense attorney is accounting for all the data points that we have, all the reports, all the facts that we have in the case. But spinning that, interpreting that data very differently from how the prosecution is doing it. And that's the case in all fields of research. We all have the same data points. There isn't like a, a study that comes out or like an archaeological report that comes out that a good scholar isn't going to get a hold of if he's writing on that topic. So if you go read somebody, I just finished writing on the Exodus and I'll stop talking, but um, I just finished writing on the Exodus, and James Hoffmeyer is an evangelical scholar out of Trinity who's a great guy um, and a really good Egyptologist, but he has a very clear bias when it comes to the Exodus. So, like, when you when his work is, I think, phenomenal. Kenneth Kitchen, his work is phenomenal, but when it gets into the Exodus, it, it to me, it gets a little shaky because... They 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 have a commitment, a theological commitment, and so but they they still have to deal with the same data points. They have to deal with things like well, we don't have evidence for a 15th century Exodus. We don't, you know, have we have the Merneptah Stila, which shows you know 1207 is the first time that we see Israel being mentioned. You know, we have all these problems with two and a half million people walking out of Egypt in you know in the 15th century. So. All, we all deal with these data points. We have to. But the problem, the, the difference is that some people construct a model that accounts for those data points that's different from the model that everybody else agrees is the one that we should be using. Uh, because that model uh, accounts for the data better. 
And that's why I think when we come to consensus scholarship, it's one of these things that at a bare minimum, you need to know what it is, know why they argue it, and take it seriously. Does it mean that it's right? No. People write dissertations that go against consensus scholarship. The fundamental difference, and everybody hear me, the last thing I say, the fundamental difference, because people will grab onto that and say, ah, does every dissertation disproves consensus scholarship? That's not true. But those that do, they're being written by people that are becoming experts in that topic. And it's usually a very, very narrow topic. So, and they've spent years reading everything about it. So they're the expert on that topic now. So the difference between a non-specialist, as good as a non-specialist, somebody like me coming to the resurrection or coming to something in the book of Acts or Mark and priority or something, even though I've got training in that, like it's not my field of expertise. So it'd be very unwise of me to go buck against consensus scholarship and say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I have a model that accounts for the data points better when I haven't read everything about it and become an expert in the languages that are required to be able to make that kind of make, make those kinds of determinations. Um, that's why scholarly consensus is so important. That was probably a lot more than you wanted to hear it. I'm sorry. Absolutely not. Because I try to ask questions that give, that get my uh, guests jazzed up, Professor Josh. <laughs> well, that one worked. <laughs> That's great. Uh, something funny first, and then we'll go to something more serious. Um, BigZebra.com goes, I was going to lead 2.5 million people out of Egypt, but then things got really crazy at work. It must have gotten <laughs> really crazy at work. <laughs> uh, but seriously, so you come from a world where there's peer review, where where when change does happen in a field, it's definitely there are mechanisms to make sure that it isn't just BS. How do you deal? Because you're online a lot. Yeah. I don't know if you realize this, but you're online <laughs> a lot. How Probably more you, than I should be. How does your brain not explode? <laughs> because, <laughs> because from what I've seen on YouTube, there's a lot of um, crap. <laughs> there's a lot of bad yeah. ideas. Yeah. And the algorithm is the YouTube algorithm, the algorithms on other social media platforms are geared in a totally different direction yeah, from the yeah. world that you are in. How, how yeah. does your brain not explode? Um, it might be foolhardy to think this way, but I guess I trust the process. Mm. That's what I think. It's a very slow process, uh, but it seems to be gaining some momentum. And what I what what process I guess I'm referring to is if you're consistently careful with the research that you do, um, and you you present that data in a again so a meticulous way as meticulous as you can be, um, and for us presenting again the consensus view on almost all these topics, what I have found is that you become a reliable source for information. And th there are definitely, like you look around and you look at YouTube channels that are in the hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and there are these Christian apologists that you listen to them and you go, uh, I have to trust the process that, like that there's something there that people are gravitating toward and that is that it's sort of this quick fix mm -hmm. to these, uh, you know, skeptical attacks or whatever. So you get you get a, a video series about slavery. You get a video series about Ezekiel twenty six and the failed prophecy. Or you get something about the Book of Daniel, and it's it, like Christians, uh, Christian evangelicals. This is all anecdotal, you know, but they they believe what they believe already, right? right. And so they're very often not so interested in really digging down into the details of the arguments uh, in order to found this tremendous argument. And I don't blame them because they have lives, right? I mean, they have other things that they're doing. And so what they're looking for is a video or a book 
that they can go, okay, that answers the question sufficiently for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can link somebody to it, right? Oh, here's this, here's this article that, I mean, it happened this morning. Here's this article that I found online about Ezekiel 26. And it's like, you read through the first two sentences and you go, like, this is what the whole chapter of my book is about, yeah. right? Um, and so I have to trust that eventually um, it'll become clear as as skeptics and atheists and I think more, re not more reasonable, what do I want to say? More um, skeptical. Sure, that that's, well, that works. Uh, more skeptical Christians to sort of these bad apologetic positions like slavery is not so bad. Right. You know, um, <laughs> um, sounds so weird to say uh, that that when they come into contact with these good resources, things that like are in my bibliography, uh, things that I cite, that they they go they read my book and that takes them to you know, these other, these other really great scholars that they'll then bring those to these big channel apologists mm -hmm. and it'll become clear over time. Well, this quick fix doesn't really suffice and they're, they're going to stay big. Like, I don't know how many question that, you know, uh, certain YouTubers are going to stay big and, and get bigger, but that their impact is going to decrease in a with the group of people that is generally uh, generally genuinely interested in more than just a cursory glance a cursory defense uh of these these bad apologetic positions i think you're spot on with that i think it's and and i don't want to sound too positive because that's against my grand dr josh to tell you the truth right 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 you're right over time good ideas will beat out bad ideas in the marketplace of, of yeah. ideas. I, I'm just trying to figure out how many times I can say ideas in a paragraph, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I think so too. Um, you know, we've been talking for a while. For people who haven't read the book, you want to just give a basic outline of it? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way that in all three, we've made it so that, as of yesterday, we've made it so that all three are laid out this way. So I'm really excited because that was my fear about volume three. Is that I don't have that, I don't think there's enough material to to actually lay it out so that it's the same, but actually Megan figured it out, so it's brilliant. Um, it's divided into two parts, two main sections. The first section is general, it's meant to be like general background information to the Bible, to the ancient Near East, and how like research is done into this, this area of study. And then the second half of the book picks up on specific hot button issues. And there are four in each volume. Um, so like specific things like, like the first fall, I mean, so, so, well, so that's what it does. It takes up specific and it goes in depth into those individual, um, individual topics or issues so much so that the goal is that the reader has a resource there that if they want to go into an actual formal debate about the topic online or with somebody at home or whatever, more informally, I guess, that it's a one-stop shop. Like mm -hmm. they know all the arguments, they know all the data points and they know the, the general consensus or the scholarly consensus on the correct interpretive model for those data points. So um, then more specifically in the first half of the book, this background introduction consists of three chapters. The first one lays out the narrative, the story of the Old Testament so like what actually is the story uh it's not concerned with it did this historically actually happen or anything like that or are there contradictions that's not relevant it's just what is it that when you would talk to uh, an evangelical or a fundamentalist christian what is the story that they're operating from what's their what when they think about creation what are they thinking about when they think about what happened to moses wandering in the wilderness what are they thinking about um so the first book, uh, the volume one goes from the creation in Genesis 1-1 down to the death of Moses at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Volume two uh, is going to go from Joshua beginning his conquest into uh, Canaan 
down to the end of the united monarchy under solomon so solomon's death and then the, the, the so, so then volume three will pick up with the division of the united monarchy under rehoboam and jeroboam the north and the south and run down through to the return of the exiles from um from babylonian uh, babylonia so uh that's the first chapter second chapter is and i'll go faster now sorry is um history of the ancient near east so volume one does the history of the ancient near east just in general uh from a mesopotamia perspective volume two will give it from an egyptian perspective uh volume three will give it from, from a syro palestinian perspective um so that should sort of cover cover all our bases then volume three is the archaeology volume three chapter three is the archaeology section the archaeology chapter so what I try to do is in volume one, it's like, how does archaeology work? What is it? What are they actually doing out there in the field? Then it moves into what is biblical archaeology and how has it developed over time? And then it gives some test cases into how archaeology works with the Philistines and with the Canaanites. And volume two is going to do something similar. It won't have the introductory material, but it's going to go into um, the uh, X, uh, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the, um, conquest what do we know about the conquest account and does it hold up and then what is it that like early israelite formation so from a strictly archaeological perspective um yeah and then the four hot button issues in volume one are slavery the dating of the book of daniel did moses write the pentateuch and the prophecy that failed against the city of tyre fantastic material it and as and as i think about the book and I just want to say this to everyone. Um, if you want to level up your game, basically, in terms of anti-apologetics or just basic history of the Bible, it's definitely worth your time. Definitely worth it. Yeah. And, and I, I will say just as sort of a final note, like I was so excited. I don't talk about this an awful lot, but I was just so excited by who agreed to endorse it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if people have noticed this, but Joel Baden has a blurb on the back of the book uh, where he, he says, the end of it says, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight and you shouldn't go into a debate about the Bible with copy of, your copy of this book handy. Like I fell out of my chair when he emailed that to me. That is um, Francesca Stavrakopoulou wrote uh, a blurb on the back and she called it a master class in how to study the Hebrew Bible in the ancient Near East. Um, Aaron Ra has a blurb on the back and it was just like, I don't know. I was really humbled by, uh, you know, who 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 agreed to do that and what they said. It was it it, it really, uh, yeah. I felt really good about that. It was great. Well, congratulations on those. those Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So there, of course we're going to have to. This wouldn't be the internet unless we talk about haters. <laughs> you know, there are atheists out there who are quick to say, "Why focus on Iron Age sheep herder fan fiction?" Right. Well, how do you respond to that? This is something that I think I'm hoping that I don't want to say good ideas. I, I think just how do I say this? Not everybody gets to study Mesopotamian history. Not everybody gets to study the, the, the history of the ancient Aries. And if they do, it's often quite, you know, cursory. Um, and even fewer people get to read the literature, mm -hmm. like the, 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 the myths and the, the poetry and the proverbs and all this that, that come out of these ancient Near Eastern cultures. And I think that because of that, two things happen. One, fundamentalist evangelicals will often, whether they admit it or not, come to the Bible as this like handed down from heaven made, you know, written in a vacuum, uh, nothing else like it. It's just so amazing, you know, piece of piece of work. And it's just like the standard and it's, Oh my God, it's so different and so progressive and so developed. It's so amazing. And that drives the second thing that happens, which is I think atheists and skeptics bucking against that, right? And what I'm so so what I'm hoping 
in time is that both sides will sort of simmer down now, you know, simmer down now. Right. Um, there are definitely things in the Hebrew Bible, it's a late compilation, right? So it's not that they're progressive, I guess. It's just that it's later in time. And so people are thinking through things more, right? So there are definitely some things that are what I would consider to be moral movements forward in mm -hmm. certain aspects of the Hebrew Bible. But like, so, so I don't want to take that away from them. Uh, but it's nothing compared to the, the bad shit that's in there, right? Um, from, from our perspective, from our 21st century moral perspective, which I think is really important to recognize um, from both sides of that, of that argument. But the other thing is, these are very, very intelligent people. Like, believe me, the goat herders were not the ones writing this, mm -hmm. right? People that are practicing animal husbandry were not the ones writing this stuff. These were the elites. These were the scribes. These were people that were the educated in the society. So, like, these are the people that are writing this stuff. And not just in uh, the Hebrew Bible. Like, there's there's not a lot of, of literature or, uh, well, let me, let me, paint a, a contrasting picture. In the book, I talk about the old Assyrian period, and there's this trade network uh, of people that are, are, if you think about Iraq today, they're going from like Northern Iraq and they're traveling across into Turkey, right? And they're, they're, there's this trade network that goes, I think it's like a thousand miles, um, but it goes back and forth between the city of Asher and the city uh, of Kanesh. Uh, at least in that area. And what they're doing is they're bringing from Mesopotamia, they're bringing tin and textiles, which are very easily uh, accessible there. And they're trekking them up on don by donkey caravan all the way up to Anatolia where they're rare and they're hard to come by. And they're trading them, selling them for silver, right? And they're taking the silver back home and they're buying a bunch more tin and textiles and you know, bringing that and then making a greater profit. And so there's this trade network that's established. Well, these are not like the highly educated elites of the society, but they are like, they're smart people, right? Um, they're very clever people and they know how to write. And we have their, their administrative texts. We have their receipts, their contracts, their letters, personal letters quite often. Um, but this, the system of cuneiform that they use to write it is a very truncated form. I think it's something like 50 signs that they use, 50 different cuneiform signs. And they all have pretty standard values. And if you know anything about Sumerian or Akkadian, there's like, if you're going to write literary text, you have to know like 700 signs or something. Um, I mean, that's a little excessive, but you have to know hundreds of signs. And they all have different values. Each sign has different values. Um, so like the bear sign can be bear, bod, bot, bot, or till. Like it could be any of those phonetic values uh, when you write cuneiform. So the point is that while they 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 know how to write, they have some they have some level of education. They can they can write these contracts and stuff um, and these letters. But it's not this advanced education that the scribes would have had. So with that being said. Um, the idea that they're like these ignorant goat herders that are, you know, that's just not the case. Um, they're and they're not Bronze Age, by the way. Uh, that's an important thing I think for everybody to say. Like they're definitely Iron Age, right? Um, and uh, so I guess I think it's important for us to recognize that for their time, the literature was beautiful, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the ancient Near East. I mean, I have. Like I can recommend English translations of Akkadian literary texts, Sumerian literary texts, incantations, omens. Um, the way that they thought was, I mean, it's brilliant. Um, we would look at it today and go, you know, like we would look at people from the 18th century and say, well, that was brilliant for their time. But I mean, like, you know, we're more advanced than that now. But that doesn't take anything away from them. And so I think being able to respect at the same time, respect the um, the value 
and the brilliance that they had in in the things that they did, the writings that they they've left us, and yet still not put that up on some pedestal where we say divine inspiration mm. brought this about. No, this is just it's common to the ancient Near East that they all did this, right? So that that's why that's why I say the Hebrew Bible is another ancient Near Eastern text or group of texts, and that's important um, to recognize. Fantastic, fantastic. So one of the things, and this was like, and I'm going to be selfish right now for a minute, is that one of the light bulbs that, that um, turned on in my stupid brain when I was reading it, Philistines and the Sea Peoples, and I had never drawn the conclusion that the Philistines were probably maybe perhaps one of almost the certainly. people. Almost certainly. So for, th for those of us, for those of the people out there who haven't heard about the Bronze Age collapse, and I know this is an insanely complicated topic. Um, gosh, Dr. Josh, can you just give me a one minute or 30 second elevator? Yes. Uh, but you know what I'm saying. Speak as yeah, yeah. if you want to about this topic. So, okay. This is a very, this is definitely a niche part of um, Near Eastern studies. So it's not my area of like specialization or expertise. Eric Klein is the person that you want to turn to for this. Eric Klein, he just wrote, he just published a, an updated volume or updated edition to his 1177 book. Uh, that's like the year civilization collapsed, I think is the full title. Super nice guy. We just had him on the show a couple, uh, maybe a month ago to talk about this, but I mean like amazing guy, but okay. In the 12th century, um, and he would argue the year 1177 is when it happens. Uh, BCE. Leading, <laughs> BCE, that's right. Leading up to this, okay, let me let me let me paint the the historical background. So, um, we're talking about around the Mediterranean, right? So Egypt up into the southern Levant, you know, Israel Palestine, Syria Palestine area, and then even over into Mesopotamia, but this whole area there uh, around the Mediterranean, and of course up into Turkey and into Greece, there's this period of time called the Amarna period, and it's in the 14th century BCE. And we know about it from this archive of tablets, 382 tablets, I think, last count, um, that talk about relationships between both kings of these major powers, Assyria, Babylonia, the Hittites, Mitanni, Egypt, um, Alashia, Arzawa, like all these Mediterranean powers, they're all writing letters to each other and they all refer to each other as brother, mm -hmm. right? And it's really interesting how it works out. Um, but then we also have a whole bunch of letters between the pharaoh in Egypt and the rulers, the little petty rulers that are his vassals in Canaan, in the land of Canaan. And what that tells us from this period is that Canaan is very much in control of, uh, sorry, Egypt is, is that what I said? Egypt is very much in control of Canaan. There are forts throughout the land. It's divided into provinces. There are Egyptian officials up there. There's a problem with Hatti in the north uh, in 13th century, but that still Canaan remains a pretty secure area for mo most of Canaan. It's a pretty secure area for, um, for Egypt. Okay. Toward the end of the 13th century, in the beginning of the 12th century, there are a lot of things that happen. And one of them is you have this movement of a group of people called the sea peoples and the sea peoples we don't have to get into it now why they left you know up in um um uh, you know like the turkey greece you know area why they left we th there's lots of discussion about that but they came down um many of them were probably already there as mercenaries it's really complicated but we have this movement of this group of sea peoples. It comes down. If you go to um, this, uh, there, there are these inscriptions in Egypt at Medinet Habu that show actual depictions of this and the text about it. Anyway, they are, they come down and there seems to be a pretty significant series of battles or fights or whatever 
between Egypt and the Sea Peoples. Okay, they're rebuffed. They ultimately get rebuffed, um, and they they we know the groups of people that made up the Sea Peoples, and one of them is named the Peleset. You also have Checker, uh, the Nanu. Uh, I can't remember them all, but off the top of my head, but. The Peleset are one of, uh, is, is one of the groups. And the Peleset, archaeologically, they seem to have, a, a, if you think of how Egypt is set up, you know, they try to go down into Egypt, they get rebuffed, and so they go north along the coast, and they seem to settle in these coastal cities in Palestine, in Canaan. So Gaza, Ashdod, um, uh, got, uh, yeah, anyway, I can't, there's a, the, the, the five of them. Uh, I can't think of the rest of them now off the top of my head. That's terrible. Ashkelon, and there's another one. Anyway, um, but there are these coastal cities that are taken over by the Peleset, and the Peleset become the Philistines. You can hear the connection, Peleset, Philistine. And what we think happens um, is that there is a, 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 there's climate change. There's a bunch of stuff. Climate change, Eric Klein argues, is a really big factor, maybe the primary factor. And um, what ends up happening is the Philistines settle. They start to fight against this group of Canaanites that are in the land that ultimately move up into the highlands, which become ultimately become Israel. So you can see that in the Hebrew Bible. There's this battling between the Israelites and the Philistines, probably reminiscent of that. You have these other small, and the reason that these can all sort of, the Israelites, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the reason that they can all form at this time in the 12th century is because the combination of the sea peoples coming down and doing all this destruction in the Mediterranean on the coast, uh, fighting against Egypt, lessening Egypt's control over Canaan, that's a huge thing. Egypt is now too weak to control Canaan, so now it frees these local petty rulers up to do their own thing. They're not vassals of Egypt anymore, so now they form their own little, their own little nations, right? right? And the combination of that with the drying up, the climate change, leads to this systems collapse. So all these major powers that have been really big, really a really big deal during the Amarna period and, and down into the end of the 13th century, there's just this period of significant decline. And this allows these uh, smaller, it, it, it continues to allow these sort of smaller nation states to develop themselves because they're not vassals of any big nation. Right. And so that allows for Israel to develop. It allows for all, you know, Edomites and Ammonites and Moabites and the Philistines to sort of, Get get some momentum and get going on the road. Yeah, and that's what struck me. Without the Bronze Age class, without the Philistines, you would not have independent Judah, Judah, uh, the Northern Kingdoms. You wouldn't have that, and that yeah. was the light bulb that went on my head. Yeah, and that's why it's so important. Um, and I talk about this stuff in Volume Two in much more detail. But the the reason that we don't see Israel until twelve oh seven with the Merneptah Stila is that. Like they're just it, we, the best information that we have is there's just a group of Canaanites, just part of the Canaanites, um, and it's not until Merneptah goes up into Canaan and fights and tries to regain some control up there because things are starting to slip um, that they're able to start forming right. And and it's I think it's this Philistine or this the Sea Peoples thing that ultimately sort of you know ag again along with all these other factors um, allows Israel to sort of come into its own um, and develop its own origin stories and, 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 and traditions and those sorts of things. Right, right, right. All right, so I'm going to uh, go back to the chat here. And um, Iron Chariot Air was um, curious about the evolution of monotheism. And once again, you, you could write novels, books, dissertations on this. But is there a, a way of understanding the emergence of monotheism oh i'm sorry uh, i i read that in monotheism in babylonia like the babylonian religion became monotheistic and i'm like hmm, 
don't know that I would say that. Um, you're saying, uh, I think what he's, he's asking is the uh, monotheism in the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. Is that what he's saying? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, I think, uh, I think it's a very complicated process. <laughs> Apparently I say that about everything because it is, um, one of my mottos is if you think it's simple, you probably don't understand it. Um, and except when it comes to slavery, that was pretty simple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you make that one complicated, you don't understand it. Um, but yeah, don't own people. That's the, okay. So, uh, but with monotheism, like it's definitely a complicated process that I think I, I would I would think, and again, not my area of expertise. It's a very specialized part of the field. Mark Smith has written extensively about this. Uh, Ted Lewis also. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, being in these uh, polytheistic centers probably had had some motivation. I suspect also um, this movement following the the fall of uh, the Northern Kingdom in 722 to Assyria. And the movement of you know northern Israelites down into southern Judah, you know this this desire to set apart Judah from Israel, I think that plays into it as well. I think it's a process that develops, and of course, you know, at looking around, um, it, it's a process that, like, it's not like Israel as a whole is uh, is developing and becoming monotheistic. They're uh, very certainly not, right? It's these elite Judean scribes. Um, that are that are moving toward that. So, like when you see in the book of Ezekiel, for example, you know Ezekiel in his vision, he's tunneling into the walls of the temple. What does he see? He sees Ishtar worship and Demuzi worship in mm -hmm. the temple. I mean, like, you know, the, the Israel, the Israelite religion, and Iron Charioteer knows this. Sorry, I'm not saying that to him. I know he knows this. Um, but there's a difference, and Christian apologists need to, I think, grab hold of this. There's a difference between Israelite religion and the religion in the Hebrew Bible. Those are very different things. And what where I see them get conflated is when people talk about how great ancient Israel was. And they say things like, look, these slaves could come from these other nations and worship the one true God. And you're like, e right. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> There's a difference between what these elite Judean scribes were doing and writing and believing and, and probably trying to implement to some degree and what the Israelites as a whole were doing is very different. You probably, it, you, you, they probably uh, don't want to appeal to uh, the, the polytheistic nature um, of, of Israel, early Israelite worship. Um, and they, and, and, but you hear them talk about it, right? Uh, last thing I'll say, you hear them talk about it quite frequently when you read through the story of the Hebrew Bible, because when you talk about, um, things like Asherah or, you know, Yahweh having a consort or something, no, 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 those are the, the Baal worse. That's all wicked and condemned in the Bible. But why is it condemned? Because they're doing it, right? I mean, <laughs> right. so these things go hand in hand. You wouldn't have so many anti-marijuana laws if people weren't smoking marijuana. <laughs> right. You don't, yeah, you don't have stuff like, uh, you don't have laws against like eating feces, right? Uh, right? Like lots of laws against eating feces. I mean, maybe there are some, I just don't know. But like, I don't hear about them all that often because people don't do that. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Dr. Josh, we're getting close to the end of our time together. And, and you know, I had like a full series of questions, which uh, I'm happy because we did deep dives into particular topics. But what I'd like to ask uh, people come on the show is, is there a question you wanted me to ask you, but you didn't get around to? Is there a topic you wanted to talk about, but we just didn't get there? And this could be about anything. I, I think um, Because it happened this morning, it's fresh on my mind. Uh, this this thing in Ezekiel twenty six, um, you know, for those that don't 
know what, what I'm talking about. There's a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel where Ezekiel is, is, is saying to the city of Tyre, the island city of Tyre, um, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come destroy you and he's going to wipe you off the map. And um, it doesn't happen. And we know from history it doesn't happen. Ezekiel himself, three chapters later, says it didn't happen. And so this is a problem, right? This is a problem that scholars have wrestled with for a long time. Now, more what atheistic or, you know, non-inerrantist, let's just say non-inerrantist scholars uh, will say, yeah, I mean, this is, Ezekiel just was wrong. I mean, he, 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 he saw Jerusalem fall and he just assumed Nebuchadnezzar was going to go do the same thing to Tyre. He probably saw him marching up there with his armies. Um, and it just didn't happen because Tyre is really hard to get into. Um, and so, you know, no harm, no foul. He was just wrong. But of course, if you hold to the, you know, Deuteronomy 18, you know, sort of failed, failed false prophet thing, then it's a real problem. Hmm. What I would say is, that somebody pushed back on me and said that my interpretation of this is wrong. That's fine. That's totally fine. But I want to be clear about what the data points are. The only people that I have read that disagree about the data points are Christian apologists. That's it. I mean, I don't remember what Norm Geisler wrote in his, like, in, but he's a New Testament scholar, wrote on this encyclopedia of Bible difficulties. I don't remember exactly what he says about it. But I mean, like, 99% of the time, the people that are disagreeing that Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be the one that was going to destroy Tyre and that Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar alone was supposed to be the one and that Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it. Like, the, the only people that are disagreeing about those data points are online Christian apologists that I have found. And I read pretty widely uh, in the secondary literature to write that chapter. So Christian scholars, evangelical scholars, liberal scholars, whatever that means, like we all agree that Nebuchadnezzar was the one that was supposed to do it and Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it and Ezekiel said so. That's what we all agree. So if that's what my interpretation is, that's wrong. Well, I mean, you have it. You're having to say to the whole of the scholarly community that they're wrong, which is fine. You might want to go get a PhD in this stuff first before you do that, though. That's just my my advice because that it's one thing. It's one thing to say that uh, just because consensus scholarship says it, that doesn't mean that it's right. It's a different thing to say, well, I don't have any expertise in this, but I think all the consensus scholars are wrong. It would be like I don't have I don't have any training in how the body works. I read a couple of articles about the heart and how it pumps, but I think that all cardiologists are wrong, right? About cheeseburgers being bad for you to eat every day. Like that's not wise. Okay, it's just not wise. Um where they disagree where evangelical scholars fall on this, and maybe this is what he meant, and if so, great. Those data points, the way that they make sense of that and still maintain the inerrancy of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture is that they say prophecy is contingent. And they say that when Jonah went to Nineveh and said, Nineveh, you better get your act together or God's going to destroy you in the next 40 days. And the king and all the Ninevites sit in sackcloth and ashes and repent. And what happens? God spares Nineveh. Yeah. This must have been what happened with Tyre. That's what that interpretation is. It's very common. A very common interpretation. Um, so you can read Robert Chisholm about that, for example. Uh, Chris Udd is another person you can read about that. So I disagree that that's what's going on. But that is an interpretation that scholarly evangelicals take. Great. Again, I disagree with it. It's not what most scholars would say about it. But if you're if 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 you're going to try to hold on to the inerrancy of the text, I think that's where you have to go. Going to things like, oh, there's a hidden Alexander the Great in chapter 26 doesn't work. 
linguistically, contextually, grammatically, like it just yeah, doesn't work. That interesting. When you said when, when you wrote that in the book, I was thinking it's like, as if I'm saying me and my boys are coming over to wreck your house. Yes. It's kind of this kind of linguistic wordplay going on there. Yeah, and that's right. If you haven't read the book, this doesn't mean it probably means nothing. But that was the what I thought about it in terms of the prophecy when they're talking about me and we. It's really just how we would talk in everyday language, to tell you the truth. It's like if I'm coming down with my crew to do something to you, yeah. then yeah. Uh, that's exactly how I would phrase it. I mean, God, think if if President Biden, you know, if if somebody were doing a prophecy about President Biden going like going to war. Right. Or let's let's President Bush, when he went to war um, and somebody were writing a prophecy about that. And they would say. He is going to go against you and destroy you, and he is going to really he's going to destroy all your oil fields and he's going to do this and he's going to send those his his armies into destroy, and they are going to kill all the people that are there. The shift between he and they is nothing more than a shift in perspective, and it shows up all the time in the Hebrew Bible, and I note several places in it. And again, that's not a debated thing among scholars. That's not debated. The whole he, they, he, they verse 12, many nations, that's not a data point. It's not debated. Um, so, yeah. And yeah. I've... I, I know you, you, if you want to limit this to an hour and we just want to end it, that's fine. I've got a couple more minutes if there are people that have questions. Uh, like I'm, Either way, I'm good. Whatever yeah, you want to I'll, do. If, if anyone does have a question, we'll let you throw it in there. Um, and, but, and I'll just say, as, as we're waiting to see if anyone has a question for you, Dr. Josh, can you tell people where they can find you online? Yeah, so we are at Digital Hammurabi, H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. Uh, that's the YouTube channel, digitalhammurabi.com. If that's too much to remember, which for me it probably would be, if you go to Amazon and type in Joshua Bowen, uh, all the books will come up, and I think we list everything. Like you can find all the information in the in. Uh, you should be able to find it in the Amazon list, but like what it title of the uh, the channel is. So, sure, sure. Uh, Big Zebra, last question here. What's the obsession with cheeseburgers? I'm obsessed with cheeseburgers, and I'm a vegetarian, to tell you the truth. I'm obsessed just because they were so delicious and not nutritious, I guess. Yeah, that, I, I'm, I've been dieting for uh, a month and a half now, and I'm down from 235 to 208, well um, which feels pretty good, but it means that I've had to eat a lot of salad. Yeah. And... I miss cheeseburgers a lot. Mm. Um, and Friday, Megan uh, took Oliver in the, in the, uh, on the way back home. Um, and, the, and the twins took, took him out to Burger King or something. I think it was or Wendy's. And she said, hey, do you want the rest of my burger? And she had gotten like a double cheeseburger accidentally. But she was really hungry. She'd eaten most of it. But there was like this little section of it left. And it was like. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but then I went and ran, so I felt better. But uh, yeah, I miss I miss eating cheeseburgers. Excellent. So I believe I have the uh, link to your site in the description below. I definitely have a link to your book. Thank you. Below. Um, and everyone, we could be talking about this for at least two or three more hours to tell you the truth, yeah. because it's. But I want to leave you wanting for more. That's showmanship, everyone. That's that's showmanship. I believe that's what people have told me. So definitely check out the book. Check out uh, Dr. Josh's site. And and thank you for showing up. Uh, Dr. Josh and everyone in the chat, I, I really appreciate you coming here on the Laughing Disbelief channel. You will all notice that there are no ads. I don't believe in ads. This is all completely um, supported. This channel is supported by YouTube members and by patrons. So if you want to throw a shekel or two, that would be fine. I would appreciate it. Um, but yeah, no ads, everyone, no ads. Dr. Josh. Make it a shekel of silver. Make it a shekel of silver. That's an important distinction. Well, we don't, don't make it like lead or something. Exactly, exactly. Wise words, sir. When's the next book coming out anyway? Uh, the plan is 2022. Um, so I, <laughs> I wrote, I don't know if everybody knows, but I wrote this book. This was the first book that Megan and I wrote together, Learn to Read Ancient Sumerian. 
and actually I'm teaching this uh, on the Tang, uh, the Atheist Network Group channel starting tonight uh, at 7.30. But I'm going through the book and teaching it. But anyway, I wrote that and that's volume one as well. And so people are like, oh, when's volume two coming out? So I'm, Megan said, you are writing that before the second volume of uh, of uh, the Atheist Handbook. So I'm going to try to get them. I've, I've got half of that book written. Okay. So I'm going to get that done and get it out of the way. So hopefully next year is the, no, the plan. No rest for the wicked, sir. I'm telling you. Yeah, but I like I it. I, I, I want to say good things about the Tang Network. I'm a big fan. Everyone knows I'm a big fan of Jimmy Liu and Trent do um faith not included if there's a night show and yeah just hang it so yeah so good work being done over there um like i said big fan of uh jimmy Liz and and trent's over at uh faith not required their thursday night show mm -hmm. at 9 p.m eastern funny guys and they're yes, doing the very... lord's work they're doing the lord's work as are you dr josh thank you once again sir do you want me to uh do you want me to take us out because i can take us out in a in a special way if if, if that would be useful I feel all thingly, sir. Go right ahead. Well, I, hey, you know, let me tell you something here, uh, <clears throat> Andrew. I, 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 I appreciate you having uh, uh, this uh, this guy Joshua Bowen on, but um, you know, uh, let me just tell you that he believes in evolution. Okay, and uh, of course, you and I both know that evolution is the dumbest thing that's uh, that's ever come uh, on the face of this planet. And let me tell you, uh, the planet's only six thousand years old. We know that because uh, you know a rock has, uh, has has never produced soup, uh, <clears throat> which uh, you know we we don't see dogs uh, producing on dogs we don't have water uh, raining down on otters okay so i'm here to help well um ken i'm just glad that you um, aren't in jail right now because i've heard you have some <laughs> recent issues with the police <laughs> spot on dr josh didn't see that coming beautiful um uh, what's his last name ken Hoven. um yeah 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 great great impersonation spot on you could come back on this channel anytime and do that <laughs> Once again, everyone, thank you very much. Um, take care. Um, I'm doing a show tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Eastern. That's my normal news roundup show. And we have Bertha Vasquez on tomorrow night, 8 p.m. She is associated with the uh, Richard Dawkins Association. She is talking about, she runs the TIES, the Teachers Institute um, of Evolutionary Science. They help teachers teach evolution in classrooms. She's in Florida. So we're going to hmm. get crazy basically oh, tomorrow nice. night at 8 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be a great show. Um, thanks again. Thank and I'm going to hit the end broadcast button right now, everyone.